For 800 years, Norrisville High has been protected by a ninja. No one knows that every four years, a new warrior is chosen. Go, ninja! A freshman to fight the forces of evil. I am the ninja. I am Randy Cunningham. Snowfall! What the hell? In my time watching Disney Channel, one part of them I always think gets a little less credit is Disney XD. It was sort of like the scrappy underdog to Disney Channel, taking the place of the shutdown Toon Disney. I always remember Disney XD being marketed as the all boys equivalent to Disney Channel, the sort of He-Man to Disney Channel's Barbie, if you catch my metaphor. While some people remember it for its live action sitcoms, can anyone say Lab Rats, I remember them for their kick-ass cartoons. Kek Patowski, 7D, even shows brought over from other countries like Kid vs. Cat. Many of these shows would slip through the cracks as the 2010s marched a new revolution of televised animation, especially on Disney Channel. But Lost Among the Titans of its era is a show that received far less fanfare. A show some of you may remember that's been seeing a little resurgence as of late, yet very few have ever truly covered it. And that show is Randy Cunningham, Ninth Grade Ninja. Created by Jed Elinoff and Scott Thomas, Randy Cunningham Ninth Grade Ninja is an action-adventure comedy series that aired on Disney XD on August 13, 2012. 2012 was like a big year for both Disney and animation. Not only was this the midst of the 2010s renaissance sprung by Cartoon Network, not only did it bring us Gravity Falls, but this was also when Disney XD reached somewhat of a peak for their programming, bringing in shows like Lab Rats and Crash and Bernstein. <laughs> Remember that one? and plenty of animated shows like Tron Uprising, Motor City, which I've never seen but holy cheese look at that intro, and Ultimate Spider-Man. You know, not the good one. Unfortunately, most of these shows will be cancelled in the span of a year. But not Randy, shoobs! I always remember when Randy was being promoted in 2012. I was turning 10 around the time and this was after when Gravity Falls premiered, so I thought I was eating good. I saw a few episodes of the show, and as it went on, I kinda gave up on it. Occasionally I would catch airings of it, yet as the years went on, I, I kinda was more into the live-action shows. And then I stopped watching TV altogether when the live-action sitcoms on both Disney and XD started to become stale. Until today, of course. Randy Cunningham Ninth Grade Ninja has got to be one of the most obscure cartoons I have ever covered. Not a lot of people have made full reviews on it. I mean, it's been reviewed by this guy, this guy, and Cosmodor- oh, wait a minute, it's gone. But you know what? That's not enough. Today, Randy Cunningham turns 10 years old, and I'm going to give this series the video it is due. Now, Randy Cunningham only has two seasons, so this will look easy in comparison to my other retrospectives. I will be fully analyzing this show from season 1 to 2 to see of whether this was the cheese or a stinking pile to be flushed down the shoe tube. I will be using a handful of Randy lingo throughout this video. And if you like what I'm doing, feel free to smoke that subscribe button and smash the bell icon to make this channel even juicier and brucier. So the question is, is Randy Cunningham Ninth Grade Ninja as good as I remember? Does it hold up 10 years later? Let's find out. This is a retrospective of Randy Cunningham, Ninth Grade Ninja. The idea of Randy Cunningham goes all the way back to 2008 by creators Jed Elinoff and Scott Thomas, a writing duo at Disney who's worked on projects such as Best Friends Whenever and recently Raven's Home, as well as projects outside of Disney such as the Banana Splits movie, Sci-Fi's Day of the Dead, and Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated? What the honkin' juice? Now if that doesn't sound like an interesting resume, then I don't know what is. 
Anyway, the idea was showcased in December of 2008, and Disney picked up the show. During this time, Toon Disney, the channel that would become Disney XD, was on its last legs, and three months later on February 12th, 2009, at 11.30pm ET, Toon Disney pulled the plug, and Disney XD was birthed onto its place. During Brandy Cunningham's development, the series was originally supposed to have less of an emphasis on comedy and more on character, with the ninja falling in love with Howard's sister Heidi Wienerman while still figuring out his identity. The sorcerer was nowhere to be found, and McFist would have kept a hefty eye on the ninja alongside Viceroy and a character named Judy, and he didn't have a signature brain fist. It also was going to have a different art style that looked akin to that of Kim Possible. For some reason though, the show was retooled, and Honan Vasquez, the creator of Invader Zim, was brought on board to design the show's characters and develop the show's art style. Other than that, however, there isn't really a lot of info regarding the development of the show. Not even the Randy Cunningham wiki has anything to say about its production. So after four years in development, Huh, that's funny. Four. Keep that number in mind because it's actually important to this video. The show would share a preview on Disney XD on August 13th, 2012, and would premiere on September 17th in Canada and 29th in America, airing on syndication up until July 27th, 2015. Almost four years! So now with all this in mind, let's buckle down and have a look at the show in its birthing years. Now before I get started, I want to mention the theme song, because, my god, this song is the honkin' BROOS! This theme song f***ing slaps. It gives the viewer a good rundown of the show, summarized by the titular Randy and how the ninja came to be. Not to mention that the animation and visuals used in this intro is just, ah, it's just gorgeous to look at, and the music perfectly tells you about the tone of the show. From the awesome and quick exposition, the kick-ass guitar solo, the rap number, the guitar cheese that plays whenever Randy's about to send a monster to the Shadow Realm, like, HOLY JUICY S***, I'M SO F***ING CHEESE RIGHT NOW! It's not the best theme song I've ever heard, but it works. It perfectly establishes the setting in the ninja and sets you up for what to expect. A ninja, farts, monsters, McFist, and s Plus, let's be real, this sh just goes f***ing hard. God damn, dude, it's, it's the f***ing cheese. Now then, let's begin. The story of Randy Cunningham is explained in the intro, as I said, but allow me to set the stage for our story. Our story takes place in the lovely American city of Norrisville, specifically Norrisville High. For 800 years, this ground, or I guess Norrisville in general, has been protected by a mysterious ninja, clad in red and black, fighting against the corruption of the evil sorcerer who has been imprisoned under the school for 800 years as well. Legend has it that every four years, the ninja mantle is passed on from senior to freshman by the Ninja Nomicon, a tome containing the secrets and lessons of past ninjas. And now that mantle falls into the hands of a new student, one of heart and soul, maybe sometimes heart and soul, and one to defend the sacred ground from the forces of evil unto the end of his years. And that student is... Sweet! I have to tell Howard! You can't tell anyone. Oh, that's wonk! Yo, oh, holy cheese, is that movie Sonic the Hedgehog? I have no idea! Yeah, don't worry, I'll get into the voice acting later. This is Randy Cunningham. Played by Ben Schwartz, a freshman at Norrisville High, along with his good friend Howard Wienerman, played by Andrew Caldwell. One day, during his summer vacation, Randy is gifted the Ninja Nomicon by a stranger, along with a mask and a promise not to tell anyone. When he puts the mask on, he is gifted the awesomeness of the ninja and so decides to take up the mantle and protect his school not only from the sorcerer, but also his new ally, the mechanized mogul madman Hannibal McFist, and his assistant, Viceroy and mostly because it makes him look like Ninja Fight Shadow the Hedgehog, which is pretty honkin' Bruce if you ask me. With all this set in stone, our hero now spends the rest of his school years battling the armies of McFist and the Sorcerer, all while learning to be a better ninja and doing what he does best. Whatever the hell high school bros even do. I don't know, I dropped out as a freshman. So how would I describe Randy Cunningham 9th Grade Ninja? Well, if you couldn't tell by the premise, it's a Spider-Man knockoff. You know, great power, great responsibility, cool powers, all that jazz. 
It mainly follows an episodic format with two segments per episode, yet much like Gravity Falls or Steven Universe or more recent examples like Owl House and Amphibia, it occasionally has the chance to expand its own universe and ideas and follow the occasional narrative. But it gets deeper into its narrative especially in Season 2. There's nothing wrong with the show having an episodic format, plenty of popular shows follow this, yet this one in particular has its own format that runs through almost every episode, which, don't worry, I'll go into as we dig deeper into this show. Wow, I can't believe it, but Randy Cunningham, 9th grade ninja, is the honkin' cheese! At first I was thinking the show would be kinda mediocre because I haven't seen it in a long ass while and also because its reputation after a certain YouTuber made a video about it. <laughs> but surprisingly enough, Randy Cunningham 9th Grade Ninja is as fun, funny, and as much the cheese as I remember it. Why I even missed out on the show is honestly beyond me. Firstly, I want to say that I adore this series animation. As I alluded to, this series art stylist was one Honan Vasquez, the creator of Invader Zim, and outside of defining the series' look, from what I have heard, he wasn't involved much with the animation process, which was handed over to the guys at Titmouse and Boulder Media, a subsidiary of Hasbro. Some of the background characters do look straight out of Invader Zim, and Viceroy has like a similar color palette to the one used in Invader Zim, but goddamn, it still looks good. This is almost 10 years old and it still holds up. It's got that edgy 2000s-esque look to it that looking at it now it does kind of remind me of Invader Zim, but also those epic bro gamer skipping homework t-shirts I used to wear to elementary school as a kid. In an age where plenty of the big cartoons either look samey or rounded out or try to resemble anime, it's so refreshing to see an art style like this that truly harkens back to the ones that I grew up with. It makes the show stand out even more in a sea of big boys, and Honan Vasquez I feel was a pretty bruised choice, and I juicing love it. The animation itself is also pretty good. Given that this was under the hands of Titmouse, they made the show look as Bruce as possible. The characters are all zippy and expressive, and the action scenes especially are well animated and fast paced and fun. What's not to like about them? They got it all. Ninja weapons, ninja fireballs, ninja fighting, robots, monsters, and SMOKE BOMB! I also would like to point out some of the creature and robot designs that show up in each episode. Some of them look really well detailed in Bruce, like the Rhinosaurus, Lucius of Thunder Punch, Spider Julian, Monster Jock, Monster Mecha Scorpion, and Catfish Boo-Ray's monster form. One thing I also like is the backgrounds, specifically how they board them. They don't look that much special except for the Sorcerer's Prison, which is one of my favorite backgrounds in the show because it has the dark and green and purple color palette, the multitude of pipes, and the dingy atmosphere, and the lone pedestal. It makes it feel kinda ancient and how it has grown with the world through time. I also like the Namicon backgrounds and the scenes with the Namicon in general. They pull off the art style of a Japanese period artwork mixed with high school journalesque doodles and it gives off a strong impression of how the Namicon was passed down and written from student to student. But what I like is how they board the characters into these backgrounds. I mean look at this! The way they position the camera makes these backgrounds look like 3D environments, which I find really captivating and it gives these areas a sense of sort of scale. Either they are 3D backdrops or they're just really good 2D illustrations. Moving on from animation, let's talk about the show's core element, the comedy. It is an action comedy after all. Yeah, it is juvenile and can border on the line of gross out, can anyone say Barnaba Jones, whose sole existence I'm pretty sure is to be nothing but a fart joke because he never shows up in the series again. And it likes some of that random XD humor that was present in plenty of Disney XD shows, I remember, but honestly, aside from that, I still think the show is pretty damn funny. I actually laughed at quite a few moments in the show, but that mainly comes down to the actors' deliveries. Seriously, even with the lowest common denominator of comedy, the way the characters deliver these lines just cracks me up. Especially Howard, who I think personally is the funniest character in the series. And I think the characters like Randy and Howard and McFist and Viceroy have surprisingly good chemistry with each other and bounce off each other really well, especially Randy and Howard, whose dynamic reminds me a bit of Peter and Ned in the MCU. Can I also talk about the dialogue for a minute? Unlike the shows I've covered on this channel, Randy Cunningham has its own set of catchphrases and slang, like Bruce, Cheese, Wonk, Zing, Honk, and my favorite, SHNASTY, which I assume are supposed to be replacements of shit, f cool, etc. Some may think it's cringe, and yeah, it can be sometimes, but after rewatching it, I don't really mind it that much. If anything, the dialogue adds to the charm of the whole thing. It's hard for me to criticize dialogue, but I'll try it anyway. So here it goes. 
These catchphrases may be excuses for actual words, but the way the characters as a whole deliver these lines make the dialogue sound surprisingly natural, and even when it's a cartoon, it comes off as actual human speak instead of just coming off as stupid and forced. Plus, using this made-up slang makes the show's dialogue seem timeless. Otherwise, if it did use real-world slang like lol, base, lamal, all that jazz, my reaction would have been different. <laughs> Even though I don't see myself using these phrases IRL, it's nice to see that the show invents its own set of words to give it a little more of that special flair. It's stuff like this in the action, and the animation, and the comedy that makes the series so charming in my opinion. I don't know how to describe it, but the show has like this earnest dude bro -y energy that flows through it, and it shows. It kinda brings me back to the time when Disney XD was advertised, as being this epic haven for boys where all the cheese happens. It's like a unique charm that makes it hard for me to even describe. As I alluded to earlier, it's like those gamer shirts I grew up with in the form of a TV show. That sounds kinda cringe, and trust me, it could have been in the modern age, but the show makes it all work in an over-the-top yet ultimately endearing way. It's just really poetic, and it gives the series a very, very unique charm. I also want to briefly touch on the music, which was composed by Brad Breek, who's worked on shows such as Fanboy and Chum Chum, We Bear Bears, Glitch Techs, Gravity Falls, of which he composed the theme song, and recently The Owl House. It's mainly comprised of rock and roll, especially in the action scenes, which can be pretty catchy and I think it fits the tone, yet it feels kinda samey. I usually don't talk about music in cartoons, yet the show also has its own set of lyrical tunes, kinda like Amphibia, that all vary in quality. Most of them sound kinda meh or flat out bad, but my personal favorite is Disorder by Randy and Howard's 30 Seconds to Math. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a full version as far as I'm aware, but, but from what I've heard of it, it's the f***ing cheese. Also, I just want to point out that the Whoopi World theme song used in the show is literally just a pitched version of We Like to Party by Vanga Boys. Take a listen. Despite my praising of the show so far, it's not all that Bruce. The show is like a theme of great power or great responsibility, like Spider-Man, or a more recent example, Invincible, yet it doesn't really dive into it all that much, nor show Randy developing his social life, like any other people will with this kind of story. Like, there's this one bit in Season 1 where, you know what, I'm getting ahead of myself, I'll save that for later. It's also a really formulaic show, looking back on it. Most of the episodes will have Randy and Howard do something to become cool, usually a ploy set up by McFist, or a thing that might lead to the sorcerer's corruption. Then Randy will chime into the Nomicon, accompanied by an Ow. sound effect, and we are introduced to the Lesson of the Day concept. The Nomicon is also kind of like a character in and of itself. It's semi-sentient, it speaks in metaphorical lessons that Randy more often than not either ignores or misinterprets because, you know, he's a total shoob. This kid ain't playing with a full deck, folks. He gets himself into trouble with the enemy, and the lesson thus comes back in the end to help him win and save the day. Now, the show being formulaic isn't necessarily a bad thing. Plenty of shows are formulaic, like Phineas and Ferb, and that's honkin' Bruce. This one works for Randy Cunningham because that's kind of the point of the show. The entire point of the series, in fact, is that Randy is an inherently flawed character and needs to learn not only to be a better ninja, a better hero in general, but also a more better person, even if it does get him punished in the end. I mean, He's a kid after all. There's a general sense of consistency with the show, as lessons are brought up more than once and a few changes are quite permanent, like Randy dropping his generic looking katana in exchange for a brucer, more durable sword. And characters and events are brought up more than once, if not cleverly foreshadowed. So despite the show's episodic nature, these elements make the show overall feel like a big journey for Randy. His story is like that of great power, great responsibility, much like Spider-Man, or a more recent example, Invincible. And while both of them have done the sort of thing with more depth and nuance, Randy Cunningham isn't necessarily the worst of this idea. He makes plenty of mistakes, and when he doesn't see the Nomicon's lessons the right way, he has to realize his mistake and owe up to it. There's also this looming sense throughout some parts of the series that the ninja stuff might feel like a burden on Randy's personal life. This shows in the episode Lucius of Thunder Punch when he feels unwanted by the school and throws away his mask in what is likely a reference to that one Spider-Man panel where he throws away his suit, only to come back in the end when he is needed. Randy deep down inside has a heart of gold, even if he often reverts back to being a shoob. There's also this one episode I like in the season where the Nomicon takes over Randy's body for a day and does some shooby actions, while the real Randy's inside the Nomicon and has to learn a lesson about balance or whatever. 
It shows that the Namacon is something that needs to be handled with responsibility. It kind of plays into that great responsibility thing and how Randy basically has to balance things out more with the Namacon. Well, at least that's how I interpret it. I also like the two-parter special The Ninja Identity and Supremacy where Randy gets amnesia and so Howard has to become the ninja. It's pretty hilarious and a cool indication that anyone can be the ninja. I kind of wish they did it with the other characters like Teresa. That sounds kind of deep, but hey, the show's not trying to be deep, and that's okay. And that's all I can even interpret of the show, to be honest. It's just trying to be fun, and to that end, it succeeds. Not every show can be the next Gravity Falls, or even the- Oh god, Steven Universe. Though if there's one thing I find wrong with Randy, personally, it's that he's not really rounded out all that much, like Spider-Man or Invincible. Another problem I have with the show is that the tone kinda undermines the more serious aspects of the story. I get that it's a comedy, but when an important scene is often disrupted for a joke, it gets kinda distracting and lowers the stakes a little. This especially shows in the season 1 finale, Randy Cunningham 13th Century Ninja. Like, Amphibia balances this out pretty well in my opinion. It's a really funny show, and even then, that knows when to be serious. But oh well. Moving on to the characters, ladies and gentlemen. Much of them are either one-note gimmicky or one-off characters and bad guys that are often voiced by a guest star, surprisingly. The real star of the show is, well, Randy Cunningham. He's brash, stubborn, a total show-off, and possibly the most dude bro protagonist I've ever seen in an animated show. And I think that's pretty Bruce. Anyway, when he possesses the ninja suit, he gains a wide variety of ninja weapons and ninja gadgets he gains later down the line, such as the Ninja Sword, Ninja Size, Ninja Chainsicle, Ninja Smoke Bomb, Ninja Rings, Ninja Trippin' Balls, Ninja Bee Balls, Ninja Tengu Fireballs, Ninja Air Fist, Ninja... Whatever the hell that thing is! Ninja Scarf that he swings around like Spider-Man! Ninja Gaiden! Ninja Go! Ninja! Ninja Turtles! Ninja Assassin! Ninja Scroll! Ninja Missiles! Ninja Dildo! Ninja Everything! Everything is the... Ninja! So he's the ninja now, and that's pretty bros. Howard Wienerman is Randy's bestest, estest friend. He is basically to Randy Cunningham what Ned Leeds is to Peter Parker, or what Genki is to Miles Morales, or what that skinny gay kid is to Invincible. And much like Ned Leeds in the MCU, Howard is my favorite character in the series because he's the funniest one. He's energetic and has somewhat of contentment for the Nomicon. That doesn't mean he's awful though, because he makes me laugh. Even with the lowest common denominator of comedy, Andrew Caldwell's line delivery just cracks me up. But he doesn't say the p-word, so he gets a 7 out of 10. I'm... looking... at... He also later gets possessed by a Japanese bird demon called a Tengu that kinda looks like a has Hotel character, which becomes of greater use later down the line. The Tengu was fought centuries ago and was imprisoned into the big center stone in the school, right atop the sorcerer's prison. The Tengu is also linked to the suit itself, as its feathers imbue the suit with mysterious power and establish a sort of voodoo doll-esque soul connection. The only way the Tengu can be vanquished is to burn the ninja mask. But don't worry, because it imprisons the Tengu and gives the suit back. <laughs> There's also Heidi Wienerman, Howard's sister and runs the school web show thingy that's kinda like the Midtown Technical from the MCU Spider-Man movies. Man, it always comes back to Spider-Man, isn't it? It usually covers stuff like drama and ninja things. Teresa Fowler, a cheerleader at Norrisville who later develops a crush on Randy, which culminates in a scene in Season 1 where Randy takes Teresa to dance and- <laughs> just, just kidding! This semi-romance goes absolutely nowhere and is used mostly as a joke. Which kinda sucks, honestly, and this leads us back to that point I mentioned earlier. I think they skipped out on Randy and Teresa getting together. Like, this could have been a decent way to develop Randy's character and get a girlfriend. Because, you know, he's a freshman. Maybe have him struggle between his ninja duty and his commitment to Teresa, or have him break up with her. But then again, romance nowadays is gay anyway, so I think Randy totally dodged a bullet on that one. Or maybe the crew are so afraid of being labeled a Spider-Man knockoff that they don't want to turn Teresa into a Mary Jane. Or even a... Oh god. A Gwen Stacy, so they probably dodged a bullet with that as well. Bash Johnson, the bully character and McFist's stepson, he's like the Flash Thompson of Randy Cunningham. He's also pretty funny in the way that he speaks, like he speaks in this sort of Brooklyn accent, even though I assume he's supposed to be Canadian like his mom or some shit. He's also at one point mistaken to be the ninja, which he revels in, of course. Stevens, a trombone boy whose main gimmick is... <laughs> Flute Girl, yep, yeah, that's her name by the way. She plays the flute and is shown to have a relationship with Stevens, and her gimmick is... You guys are idiots. Yeah, remember when I said most of these characters are pretty one note? Bucky, the triangle boy whose whole shtick is that he likes to make puns, or zings if you will. Debbie Kang, this one girl and Teresa's friend, she's also obsessed with a creature called a Mexican death bear as shown in her own Halloween costume. 
Keep her in mind because that's surely not the last you'll see of her. This clown guy? Yeah, that's all I can say about him, he's, he's just a f***ing clown. Though he is one of the common people to turn into a monster. Accordion David, he plays accordion and speaks in some kind of accent. Morgan, the stereotypical mean girl and professional dancer. Principal Slimovitz, the school principal who owns a fancy car, which is actually a running gag in the series where he gets his car destroyed every time someone turns into a monster. Kinda like that, kinda like that cabbage guy from Avatar. Mrs. Driscoll, the scientist teacher who walks around with her skeleton buddy Jerry, who, who was actually a scientist once like Viceroy and actually comes to life in the Halloween episode before he is short-lived. Also fun fact, that Halloween episode ends on a jump scare. Hey, how's it going? S. Ward Smith, the blind metal shop teacher and a swordsmith himself, hence the name. He's one of the better side characters in my opinion because he bounces off Randy's immaturity pretty well. He's kind of like the straight man in the series, in a world of over-the-top weirdos. He is also one of the few people in the school that knows Randy is the ninja, and has worked with the ninja for several years. Oh my god, I think I'm taking forever with this. Uh, there's also the music teacher, the over-the-top PE teacher, Mr. McBritish, I forgot his name, the janitor, the social studies teacher who had a boyfriend from the 80s that turned into a monster and sounds weirdly like Popfish from Skylanders, and the French teacher, Mrs. McMommy, you're making my dick hard, that shows up for one episode in season two. <laughs> Jean Levine, the disposal machine who absolutely, positively speaks in a very funny accent. Greg of Greg's Game Hole, he runs the Game Hole arcade down the street where the boys like to play and buy games and junk. Skibow! And I saved the best for last, Julian. The goth kid who sticks out like a thorn in a rose compared to other goth characters I've seen with a signature top hand tuxedo, vampiric fangs, eyeshadow, and wheezy ass voice. Keep him in mind by the way because despite his role as a side gag character, he actually plays a significant role in the series later down the line. And no, I'm not shooting you. Speaking of which, the villains ladies and gentlemen. Hannibal McFist is one of my favorite villains in the show. He's like evil Tony Stark with the insanity of Dr. Eggman. He even dons an Iron Man-like persona to one-up the ninja in one episode. Anyway, he's the most powerful and most celebrated McMahon in town. Hell, not even Randy can get enough of his McCheese. You can't take one McStep in around Norrisville without McSeeing Mick on McEverything. McSatchleys, McRoboApes, McRobots, McMuseum, McFreaks, McSquiddles, McTars, McTheers, McDonalds, McRoboArm with McRoboBrain? This brain is never elaborated on by the way, and is probably just there for show. Which is actually kinda hilarious. Like, did he just steal some guy's brain just so he can look cool? McFist is a self-centered narcissist who often infringes on the ideas of his assistant, Viceroy, to one of the ninja and gain his gift from the Sorcerer, an unknown superpower, presumably to put himself on top of the game. He, or I guess technically Viceroy, tend to set up elaborate schemes to draw out the ninja, which Randy always falls for because, you know, he's a shub and whatnot. McFist is in actuality a really incompetent goofball and has a tendency to yell a lot, which I feel amplifies his spoiled nature. Aside from that though, he's just fun to watch. He's funny, charismatic, he's a terrible boss to his robo-apes, which are like his minions by the way. In fact, this becomes a subject in the episode Rise of the Planet of the Robo-Apes, and he and Viceroy have good chemistry with each other as the maniac and scientist sidekick. He's certainly no Bill Cipher or Heinz Doofenshmirtz, he's not the best, but you know, he, he's pretty fun. He also has a wife named Marcy, and I know what you're thinking. Shut the juice up. Anyway, she's- <laughs> HOLY JUICE! God damn, Hannibal! I didn't know you were base! Step aside, Adalia Blight. I think I just found a new evil big bad babe. Pure ecstasy. Anyway, her name is Marcy, and she loves Hannibal very much. And she speaks in a Canadian accent. In fact, a few of the characters in the show speak in Canadian accents. Viceroy. This guy is also pretty funny. He's McFist's head of robotics and sciences and creates every invention used to take down the ninja, which McFist will often infringe upon. There is Mac Anfi, who is a knockoff of Rex Quan Do from Napoleon Dynamite. You know, the guy that says, Do it again. Anyway, he's the head of his own ninja camp where he teaches kids to fight like ninjas, except he does it the Mac way, so you know, he's gotta crank it up. He was also an owner of the Namacon himself, the ninja of 85, which was foreshadowed in the episode Stanked to the Future. But as he became caught up in the greed, he gave up the Namacon while still holding on to the ninja's powers, which explains his superhuman strength and speed. And so desiring full power, he's vowed to find and destroy the ninja. Until the episode Enter the Namacon, where Randy uses the ultimate lesson, which is just ninja amnesia, 
to make Mac give up his powers. The Sorceress. The girlfriend to the sorcerer who was once sent to the Shadow Realm but then escaped and took on a sexy disguise to free the sorcerer and destroy the ninja. But then she retreats and is sent back to the Shadow Realm in another episode. Catfish Bure, a really funny swampy guy who controls animals and has some weird voodoo magic dusty hickey. And he's voiced by Jimbo Cumbadingus. Skibow! <laughs> and I saved the best for last, again, the sorcerer. A tall ass, lanky ass, cucumber looking ass warlock who was pretty much the green goblin of Randy Cunningham. But it wasn't always like this. Once upon a time, this mean, green, corrupted fiend was once a lowly peasant living out a normal life, until one day when he discovered some magic green balls that granted him unimaginable power, of which he has put to good use by wreaking chaos in early Norrisville, until he was met in great battle by the ninja, which resulted in his imprisonment under what would later become Norseville High. Ever since then, he has sworn vengeance against the ninja, so that one day, he would be free and wreak havoc upon the world once again. Of which he briefly gets his wish several times. See, the sorcerer possesses an ability called Stank, and you might be asking, what Stank? Well, the sorcerer is drawn out by negative emotions. Sadness, humiliation, depression, all that jazz. Sadness! Sadness despair, despair! Grief! This smell of sorrow reaches the sorcerer via the sewers, which draws out his smelly stank clouds that turn the students into monsters. Think of it like the corruption in Steven Universe, but from an actual source. Nobody is off limits from Stank. Students, adults, McFist, even the robots at one point. The only way for a person to be unstanked is to have an item important to them be destroyed, be it something they hold dear, or for them to not feel bad about themselves. Like in the episode Schlump, there it is, where Randy manages to get Teresa back to normal by giving her flowers and telling about how Randy loves her. Anyway, back to the sorcerer, I think he's a good enough villain overall. He's not really all that complex or anything for that matter, he's simply just a guy that does evil sh** for a living and gets mild enjoyment out of causing chaos. He's like a sadistic anarchist, an agent of chaos if you will. Oh wait, wrong reference. He's really maniacal and conniving and always fetishistically eager for his next victim and makes up for it for his fun, maniacal personality. And also because he's voiced by Tim Friggin Curry. Speaking of which, the voice acting is pretty top notch for a Disney show. They got a really impressive voice cast and they all do a solid job with what they're given. As I have alluded to, Randy is voiced by the one and only Ben Schwartz, who many of you may know as the voice of movie Sonic the Hedgehog as well as Dewey in that DuckTales reboot. If you know any of those characters, then that's probably all you'll hear out of Randy. But Schwartz does a really good job with Randy, amplifying his dude bro energy, and it's just a great fit. And he also has great chemistry with fellow Disney actor Andrew Caldwell, who's had a few minor roles in shows like Hannah Montana, and as far as I know, this is one of his only two voice acting roles. Which kind of sucks because he plays one of the funniest characters in the show. This satchel is going to change everything! When people see we got a McSatchelay, they'll worship our cheese! McSatchelay 299.99! The two of us splitting one McSatchelay is the Best idea we've ever had. Yeah, about that. Oh, nice work, Cunningham. Mac Anthony was a full on nice wad until you unsploded him back into a jerk wad. I'm totally shoobed. He'll keep coming after me and everyone I know. Sometimes I wish I wasn't everyone you know. That's what Wooter Papa was saying. El Bruchismo. If we took him to the pet park, we could rub everyone's faces in any of his four butts. You're right. I absolutely should use my ninja skills to spring him. Yes, do that quick before the Namak. Oh, right on cue. Gonna have fun? Not on my watch. I hate you. You hear me? Hate. Prolific voice acting legend John DiMaggio voices McFist, and if you know DiMaggio, you'll probably get a kick out of McFist. He screams a lot as well, which is kind of funny. When I told you to design an evil new creation to catch the ninja, did I say anything about it being a disgusting, useless blob? Get rid of them! All of them! Bring out the chair of torture! The rack! The Iron Maiden! Now! The pair of anguish! And, uh, uh, feels like I'm forgetting one. Um, I'll get my mind reader. We can figure out what you're forgetting. You have a mind reader? Why didn't you tell me? You never asked. What am I supposed to be, a mind reader? Once again, you send an incompetent robot to do a competent robot's job. Give me a break. The ninja is in fuego. You've lost a robot every single day. Nice, Roy. Get out of here. Not if you're going to yell at me. I'm not going to yell at you. 
DiMaggio also voices characters like the Robo Apes and Gene Levine. Kevin M. Richardson, my favorite voice actor, voices Viceroy, and he does this unique voice that's very different from all the big, bombastic characters he's always known for playing. It sounds very flamboyant and lackey-ish, and, and, and for lack of a better term, it just sounds gay. Which is a good thing, because Viceroy and McFist have such fun chemistry with each other. Hannibal, I've worked day and night and broken every law of physics to build you a time machine. You gonna tell me what you need it for? So, you're the ones claiming you broke a pair of McPeepers. Sorry, boys, but that is just no... But they're indestructible. I'll prove it. Mm -hmm. See? Indestructible. Oh, Francesca, will you and the stable boy ever find true love? Viceroy, what are you doing? You have reached Viceroy. I can't get to the phone because I'm attempting to enjoy the only day of vacation my unethical boss gives me each year. Leave a message after the tone. Tone. Viceroy! Seriously? How could I be the ninja? He's standing right there! Other than that though, they also got an impressive guest cast for some of the one-off characters like Andy Dick, Andy Richter, Jennifer Tilly, Bill Hader, Annie Potts, James Hong, Simon Pegg, Paul Rubin, Steve Zahn, who is one of my favorite of these guest stars, John F Oliver, Gilbert, Gottfried, God rest his funny ass soul, Patrick Warburton, Joel McHale, and Bruce Campbell? What the honkin' juice? That's honestly impressive for a Disney show, like what was their budget for this? Two million bucks per episode? But my favorite performance in this series has to go to Tim Curry as the Sorcerer. And here's the funny part too, the Sorcerer is actually voiced by three actors. First it was well known actor Tim Curry, who played the Sorcerer for about 25 episodes in the first season, then he was recast for one episode, which I think is likely connected to him having a stroke in 2012. So in the episode Brandy Cunningham 13th Century Ninja, he's voiced by what I assume to be JB Blank, who I know mostly as the voice of Braum in League of Legends. And after this one episode, for the remainder of season 2, he's voiced by the late Ben Cross, an actor with a resume in films such as Star Trek, Sorcerer, etc. Here's a comparison. Hello. I don't think we've met. I am the Sorcerer. I have been down here for 800 years. You've probably heard of me. Ah, artificial fear, digital misery, binary humiliation. Time for me to take matters into my own hands. <laughs> Here's to old friends and you. Chaos. This is the most boring week ever. No breakups, no burnouts, no blunders. Everyone has been disgustingly gloom free. Fortunately, McFist has assured me he has a plan guaranteed to crush the school school spirit. <laughs> we made a deal, McFist. My freedom in exchange for the superpower of your choosing. But you continue to fail me! Perhaps it is time to find another worthy of my reward. You have failed, Ninja! The stone is finally mine! I will harness its power and enslave you all! <laughs> it is the dawn of a new era. When our friend Bure found one of my power balls, he became my puppet! Jealousy, anguish, despair. It's a veritable buffet of betrayal! <laughs> my power gave him what he wanted. Now he will give me what I need. CHAOS! Remember when Halloween wasn't so commercial? It was about fear and terror. This just took a turn for the frightful. <laughs> Out of all these actors that play the sorcerer, Tim Curry is easily the best one. He sounds so slimy and sadistic and somewhat sophisticated and a genuinely great fit for the sorcerer. It really sucks he couldn't come back after season 1, because it's really damn good. So overall, I had plenty of fun with Randy Cunningham. It's not as emotionally deep or compelling as other Disney shows, which is probably why it's grown overshadowed over the years. And like, that's okay. 
It's not trying to be deep or anything, it's just trying to be fun, and while it does have its problems in its tone and development, it succeeds at what it's trying to be. It's funny, the animation and style is really good, most of the characters are entertaining, the world is interesting sometimes, it's witty, it's Bruce, it's everything one would expect from an action comedy and more. And so after many Bruce adventures, ranging from making new smoke bombs out of a Christmas tree, an episode of Randy going to ninja camp to meet Mac Amphi, which I'm to believe is a prequel episode given that he has his old ninja sword, and it was implied that Randy met Mac before, saving Gilbert Godfrey's Reginald Bagel all thanks to the tellings of one catfish Bure, and another almost fatal encounter with the sorceress. Randy goes on a field trip to make Fist's factory, and being a total shoob, he decides to run off. Meanwhile, McFist plans to go back in time using his newest invention, the Porta Potty Time Machine, to get more of his favorite cereal. You know, if I had a Porta Potty Time Mix shit, I'd probably go back in time and get some cereal straws. Now those were the cheese. Back on topic, the sorcerer has had enough of McFist's McFailures to make catch the ninja and thinks he should find someone more worthy of his reward. Back to Randy and Howard, they lumber around until Howard finds the timing shit and takes a big fat 1213, which sends our heroes back to, well, the year 1213. Ido Norrisville, as I like to call it, very Japanese looking, which kind of begs the question of how the juice this town was even founded, but who cares? It's a comedy, and real world logic is for shoobs. Anyway, they take a look around the town until it is attacked by a stampede of stanked rats led by the old sorcerer himself. An epic fight breaks out and Randy is hanging by the sorcerer's prison hall when he's rescued by none other than the first ninja himself, or as I like to call him, Ninja Prime, played by Joel McHale. He also has an assistant named Plop Plop, played by Adam Pally, which is hilarious because it's the sound of shit plopping into a toilet. Ninja Prime was gonna throw the sorcerer into that hole, but because Randy has walked the past, the present has been altered. The Sorcerer is free and is causing chaos across the town, and it's turned to Mad Max Fury Road out here. So now Randy has to team up with Ninja Prime to defeat the Sorcerer, as he is free and has taken the Tengu Stone. Come, my friend, shloom with me. They shloop into the Namicon, and the lesson for our heroes is you cannot write the future until you write the past. Basically, meaning that he has to fix the timeline and put the Sorcerer back in that hellhole or else the fate of history will be changed forever. Back in the main timeline, the sorcerer wants to see the ninja for himself, to see him witness his untold failure, and to make him bleed. Back in Edo Norris, Ninja Prime says he quits. With the sorcerer more powerful thanks to the Tengu Stone, Ninja Prime had given up. He lost hope, and he leaves the town with Plop Plop to follow. With the entire timeline and the world at stake, it's up to Randy and his friend to fix the future and write the past. It's time for the moment we've been waiting for! Ninja vs. Sorcerer. Even though it's not the main timeline one, but whatever, it's Bruce anyways. So Randy fights the Sorcerer, allowing Howard to get the Tengu Stone and for him to get possessed by the Tengu. Again. So it becomes a kaiju-linked fight, kind of like that one movie, Colossal, starring Anne Hathaway. They fire up and fire down, while Ninja Prime watches and decides he's gonna write the past himself. Just as Randy is on the cusp of doom, Ninja Prime intervenes, tossing the sorcerer into the hole and sealing it with a large stone, and scattering four sorcerer balls across the land. And then they imprison the Tengu back into the stone, and just like that, it was over. But let's keep playing fight scenes so that the main can work. After that, Ninja Prime thanks Randy for his help, and Randy tells him to restart his legacy into the book. And they do the thing that kind of drags on for too long, and then they go back to the present. And so, the season ends with Randy cementing himself into history, and granted the opportunity to write his own story. The end. Actually, it's not the end. There's an after credit scene, in fact, where Catfish Bure finds one of the Sorcerer Balls. A foreshadowing of what is to come. 
Aside from that though, I thought the season 1 finale was Bruce. The fight scenes were pretty epic, it was pretty funny, and it felt like this one had actual stakes in not only the current timeline, but in all the timelines, even though it was kinda undermined by the humor. But yeah, still pretty Bruce. Randy Cunningham, 9th Grade Ninja Season 1 was the absolute cheese. Is it perfect? No, obviously. It has a few problems, but I had plenty of fun with it. It was funny, the action scenes were cool and fast paced, there's somewhat of a core, the characters are mostly enjoyable, and overall this was a really fun show to revisit. It's not a really deep show or whatever people expect from cartoons nowadays, because as I've said, the show ain't trying to be all that deep. It's just all in good fun, and that's what matters most. But yeah, it was pretty Bruce, and I give this one a 7 out of 10. But season 2 though, that's a whole new cheese entirely. I won't sugarcoat this, so let's just jump right into it. It's year two for our radical ninja rascal, assuming time actually does fly in the series, of which Randy should be in a new grade by now, but whatever. So one day, Catfish Bure comes down to the school as a substitute. Turns out he's being mind controlled by the sorcerer via one of his four scattered balls. Turns out that Randy walking the timeline has caused a butterfly effect in scattering four of the sorcerer's balls across Norseville in the current timeline. Which, if in the wrong hands, causes one to go insane and desire ultimate power. Which shows in the episode, Julian's Birthday Surprise, which caused him to briefly open a portal to the Shadow Realm, but thankfully the ninja came in and closed it. It's also in this episode we get a peek at the sorcerer's backstory. As I've said before, he was once an average guy living an average life until one day when he found an evil green ball that opened a portal to the Shadow Realm and switched out his good self for his evil self, of which the sorcerer was born. So now our hero must find and protect the sorcerer's balls from the wrong hands. All while other Bruce sh** goes down. So Randy Cunningham Season 2 doesn't have much of a story going on. It kinda reminds me of Steven Universe after Season 1. It doesn't really have a sense of direction for our story and our leads. Things that are seemingly important just pop up and are forgotten about until several episodes later. Such is the case with Debbie King and Evil Julian. However, unlike Steven Universe, it's less bad for Randy Cunningham because it doesn't have too many plot beats and the, uh, filler does not suck. I honestly don't have a lot to say about Randy Cunningham Season 2. It's not bad by all means, it's still pretty good. Better than the first, by only a small margin. It doesn't really feel much like a true season, and more like a DLC pack with extra levels and quality of life changes. If I were to compare it to a video game, then I would say Randy Cunningham Season 2 is the Overwatch 2, or the Galaxy 2 of Randy Cunningham. First up, the animation still looks pretty Bruce. For one, there's more fluidity in the movement sometimes, as well as a notable camera shake in some of the action scenes, which I think makes them more fun to watch, especially the music fight with Lavender Heart. And the colors are notably more saturated this time, and it makes the show look more vibrant and colorful, and I like it. And I also like how there's a heatwave effect in some of the hot episodes, it just makes the colors pop even more. Season 1 looked a little desaturated in some of the episodes, which I can't tell if that's either a Disney Plus problem or if the animation just really evolved, but it's Bruce either way. And I also like the backgrounds in the Shadow Realm. It draws from Mesoamerican imagery and its architecture, and it gives the realm an air of mystery. Like, like was there a civilization in this realm before the sorcerer was discovered? I don't know. Another thing that's changed in this season is the sorcerer's design. Aside from his voice, his look looks mostly the same, but with notable gold runes on his cloak. His green skin is more saturated, and he has less balls around his belt, of which I counted, and he has approximately 10. The writing in the season also feels better this time. While it is still reliant on potty humor, the show still makes me laugh with its witty banter and engaging dialogue. One thing I like about the season is that it's actually more creative with its episodes. It reminds me of Amphibia Season 2 in a way, and it holds some of my favorite episodes in the series. Like, there's just one Inception parody episode where Randy gets stuck in a dream thanks to a sorcerer ball. So it's all just Randy and Howard for a majority of the episode, and it shows off their dynamic more. There's an episode where Randy and McFist have to escape Scrap City, and it's pretty cool to see where he puts all the robots away from the previous season. As well as it being funny to see McFist just do nothing while the ninja does all the dirty work, it's so McFist for him to do. Oh, so now you put that brain fest to good use? What else you got in there? A microwave? An injector full of nanomachines, son! 
There's an episode where we get a tour of McFist's house, complete with McPaintings and other McBruce stuff like a Mick Arcade and a Mick Cowboy Town. The obligatory Halloween episode where the team fights the haunting Halloween Joe with the power of cute. Which is actually one of the few episodes where Randy doesn't learn a lesson from the Namacon. Not because he doesn't want to, but because a lesson is just never brought up. S. Ward Smith returns for an episode, which is pretty nice because he's pretty Bruce. There's an episode where Randy and Howard go shopping for swag and also introduces Robo Ninja, or as I had to call him, Metal Ninja, that comes with all the ninja's weapons and abilities. Oh, that's what that thing is. <laughs> so honkin' Bruce. And by the end, Randy and Howard sing a rap song about shopping with pimp gold and robo bitches and lying with a censored neck chain. No, I didn't edit that, that's how the episode is on Disney+. Plus. There's a prequel episode, surprisingly, that shows off baby versions of the characters, as well as how Randy and Howard met, and the Ninja of 05. Or as I like to call him, Ninja Kronk, who is probably the brucest ninja in the show because he's literally Kronk in appearance and voice. Plot Plot returns for an episode, there's an episode where Randy fakes a disease to stay at home, there's an episode where Slimovitz has a supporting role surprisingly, and helps save the school from Robo Principal Rubens, an episode where Randy is the one to be rescued by the students of Norrisville, and an episode where Debbie King reveals the ninja's identity. And this is where I start to see the season ads flaws. Remember when I said Debbie Kang would show up again? Well, here, she has a small story where she becomes the J. Jonah Jameson of Randy Cunningham and tries to unmask the ninja, of which she does in the episode Debbie Metal. Randy Cunningham, ninth grade ninja? It sounds ridiculous. That's 13 episodes after the episode All the Juice That's Fish to Swim where the storyline is set up, and it has practically no build-up. You see, the problem here with this season is that it feels like it doesn't have a sense of direction for any of the plot beats it introduces. The only one they kinda do well is where Randy has to find and protect the four sorcerer balls. And then there's Evil Julian and Debbie Kang, of which they don't do anything with her until later on. They don't build it up or show any hints to something developing, they just kind of forget about it for a while. It's the same problem as Steven Universe, but here, it's less bad. Which sucks because the actual episode where Debbie reveals the ninja's identity is really compelling. It shows Randy at his most vulnerable now that his friends and enemies know his identity, so he has to struggle without using the ninja suit, but then they resolve this plotline with a bullshit fake ninja puppet and the Namacon wiping out Debbie's memory. Also, I think McFist forgot Randy's name as well since he doesn't bring up Randy's name after this one episode. Also, also, what about the sorcerer? Did he overhear this? Does he know Randy's the ninja? Or was he just meditating while all this was happening? If you're just gonna ignore a certain plot beat for a good chunk of the season, then why should I care? It just feels like the writers forgot about the scene until someone brought it up. Or they think the audience watching the show has the brain capacity of a potato. You know what they should have done? In my opinion, I think they should have incorporated small scenes, maybe even at the end of each episode of Debbie spying on Randy and his friends and deducing the ninja's identity by herself, as well as her appearing on Heidi's show providing updates on her research and finding clues like, say, one of the ninja's weapons. That would not only develop a small storyline and showcase where it's heading, but also give flawless build-up to this episode, even if it would end haphazardly. This same problem of not showing much applies to Evil Julian, who I personally believe is the weakest villain in Randy Cunningham, but I'll save that for later. Randy also gets Ninja Sense, which is basically just his heightened senses, and it's never used anywhere again. Like, come on, even the Tengu Fireball and the Air Fist are used more than this. Oh yeah, I should probably talk about the season's story, should I? The main storyline for the season is that Randy has to protect the Sorcerer's four scattered balls. Apparently him walking up the timeline has caused a butterfly effect and for the Sorcerer balls to scatter across Norrisville. This story is okay for the most part, yet it also suffers from the same problems as Debbie Kang in that it's skipped over for filler and feels disjointed and almost non-existent as a result. I am perfectly fine with how the season is because it's fun, but it almost feels like they were told not to have a story or something. It's like a requirement from Disney. And Randy doesn't even realize or figure out that he walked up the timeline. He doesn't think that him going to Edo Norrisville caused these four balls to appear in the current timeline. Well, I guess that makes sense because, you know, he's a total shoob. Of course, if you just ignore the incredibly flawed story, then what you have is a pretty good improvement of the first season. The action is still pretty cool, and Randy and Howard and McFist and Viceroy still have some good chemistry together. And they're always pretty funny. Also, even though he's stuck in the Shadow Realm, Julian still appears in the show as a background extra. I'm pretty sure it was an animation error, but I just wanted to point that out. Speaking of which, Season 2 has a fair share of new characters like Mort, Howard's kind and considerate father and an employee at McFist Industries, voiced by Bing Bong from Inside Out. You know, it's funny, we see Howard's parents, but not Randy's parents for some reason. Maybe one of them died in an alleyway or something like that. Doug. Oh yeah, Hannibal has a friend named Ruth. Yeah, that's pretty much it. She do be looking kinda bad though. 
Rachel, the cutest, squeeest character in the series. She's basically the Gwen Stacy of Randy Cunningham, but like, not, not really. She loves all things Squee and is in fact a diehard ninja fan. She even wrote a song for him, which is genuinely one of the best songs in the series. I should be surprised after all since it was written by a fan, like an actual fan of the show. If I were to take a pick between all the girls in terms of personality, I'd say she's the best girl. She also, probably, sleeps in a room like this. Lavender Hot, Ray and Owie's old nerdy bandmate who got kicked and sold himself to the sorcerer which gave him special blue state powers that caused chaos and put him on top of the world. He came over to perform big and get revenge on all Ray. He also gets state himself into an electro guy that looks like the son of that fat on virus from Scooby-Doo, and he's responsible for one of the Bruce's fights in the series, which is basically that music fight from Doctor Strange 2, but you know, Bruce. -er. Honestly, I wish this guy stood around with some more, because he was pretty good while he was at it. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Robo Ninja, or as I like to call him, Metal Ninja, because he's pretty much the Metal Sonic of Randy Cunningham. A robot created by McFest with the exact same moveset and weaponry as the Ninja, which Randy defeats by using Lucius O Thunder Punch, which was conveniently sold in the same shop where he was selling the Ninja gear. Ninja Kronk, the cronkiest, bruciest ninja to walk the halls of Norrisville High. Truly, one of the ninjas of all time. The Interterrestrials, right? An underground race led by one Queen Gabnadine, right? Who I think worship and are protected by superheroes, of which they kidnap Randy to absorb his hero to save their species. Right? Which, uh, I don't remember there being other superheroes in the show other than Lucius or Thunder Punch. Right? Which also begs the question of where the hell are the other supers when Norrisville is at near death at the end of the series? Right? But who cares? World building's for shoops. Right? Unrelated, but there's something in the lore called the Narisu 9, which I don't think is ever brought up in the series, and I didn't even know about them until a YouTuber pointed it out. But for those that didn't know either, it was basically a Power Rangers-like team-up of ninjas led by Ninja Prime that fought the Sorcerer long ago. I don't know what happened to the other ninjas, but I assume they likely died. I don't know, I'm not caught up on Randy Cunningham lore. There's also these two restaurant owners that are like rivals to each other, but I honestly forgot their names. And I saved the best for last. Again. Again. Evil Julian. Or as he's called by the fandom, Gulian. Which doesn't really roll off the tongue, but whatever. This magical, maniacal, and later mechanical menace is an evil clone of Julian from the Shadow Realm, the same one that gave birth to the Sorcerer and imprisoned the Sorceress. <laughs> now in the mortal plane, he takes the appearance of regular Julian except his skin is paler, his clothes are milky white, and he has the ability to turn into a stank monster at will, which is never brought up in the show again. He's like the, uh... The, uh... Y you know, he's like, uh... Oh god, I don't know what Spider-Man character to compare him to. Oh wait, I got it! He is the Nemoroth from Space Marine of Randy Cunningham! Yeah, I think that's a good comparison. He got into the <laughs> via a mirror in Snow, Oklahoma, and then he's been building up his plan, which is never shown in the show. He builds a giant robot, and then he takes on a semi-mechanical form, and then a truly mechanical form. His goal throughout the series is that he wants to gather the four Sorcerer Balls, of which he has one in his possession, bring his minions to the mortal plane, and become unassailable. Just like Nemeroth. I mean, that sounds pretty Bruce on paper, but I sincerely believe that Evil Julian? Mecha Julian? You know what, screw it, I'm gonna call him EJ. Anyway, I think Evil Julian is the weakest villain in Randy Cunningham history. For one, he's only in the season for about five episodes, and he does practically nothing until the last two episodes in the series. Once again, he suffers from the same problem as Debbie Kang in that he's mostly non-existent. He shows up in the segment Snoklahoma as his introduction, and he has this eerie vibe when he leaves. Then he takes action in the segment Mastermind of Disastermind, where he builds a mech suit, forms a semi-mech suit with the Sorcerer Balls, and then he survives. And literally several episodes later, he comes back in big trouble in Little Norrisville. That's literally the tail end of the series, and the events that followed are mostly out of pure contrived luck. He doesn't have a lot of build-up to his story, and feels less compelling and threatening as a result. 
but if anything, at least he's more intelligent than anyone else. He makes full use of the situation and knows at least how to retreat, but even then that barely does justice to a poor storyline such as this. You know that post credit scene from the film Morbius? Well, in my opinion, I think they should have gone down that direction for Evil Julian. Have him go around Norrisville and coerce the show's villains, including McFist, Blu-ray, and, I don't know, Lavender Hart, to do a villainous team-up. The Fearsome Four, to find the other Sorcerer Balls, free the Sorcerer, and destroy the Ninja in exchange for a wish from the Sorcerer himself. They all corner the Ninja by the end, only to have EJ betray the team, steal all their superpowers and balls, open a portal to the Shadow Realm, and ascend to mighty, assailable, Sorcerer Supreme God of the Multiverse. And then Randy gets to team up with the Sorcerer and the other villains to take down EJ, with the Sorcerer of course sacrificing and redeeming himself in the process. Also, have Evil Julian know the ninja's identity so that the story could have more stakes. Not only would this make for a genuinely compelling and funny storyline with the villains' personalities clashing with each other, but it would also test out the skills and lessons Randy has learned throughout his adventure. Kind of like the episode Raiders of the Lost Namicon. Or heck, have this guy form the Fearsome Four slash Fearsome Five, tell us who the Juicy is, and give us an explanation for his motives since he's practically the Snoke of Randy Cunningham. But you know, before Snoke was ruined. And don't you worry, I will talk about this person later. Eventually. Plus, genuinely speaking, I find Julian to be really annoying. Why, Ninja, don't you recognize me? <laughs> Make your choice, Ninja. All the balls are mine. Soon, your world will belong to me! <laughs> Bring me the balls! <laughs> I'm Evil Julian, from the Land of Shadows. Huh? Hello! Julian wears all purple, I wear all white! Uh... How has no one noticed this? You're the most annoying person on the planet. I am of the unpopular opinion that thinks Dee Bradley Baker is kind of an annoying voice actor. I don't know, he's great for animal noises, but sometimes whenever he uses his speaking voice, it's like grinding a chalkboard on my eardrums. And Julian, all versions of Julian, is no exception. They could have deepened his voice a little to make him more intimidating, or heck, he should have just spoke with a voice like this. So, you like kicking butts, do ya? Well, we'll show you, old man! Damn. Speaking of which, I still think the voice acting is pretty Bruce. The other highlight for me in the season is the late Ben Cross as the Sorcerer, who is my least favorite voice actor for the Sorcerer. Now I don't think Ben Cross is a bad actor, I think this voice could have fit a younger version of the Sorcerer, but here his voice just sounds too over the top and lacks the sort of sinister sophistication that Tim Curry's Sorcerer had which genuinely gave the Sorcerer an evil feeling and an evil presence. I think a better replacement should have been either Mark Hamill or Ron Perlman. Sure, they might have sounded too different, but at least they would give a more sinister performance befitting of the Sorcerer. So Randy Cunningham's Season 2 overall is a mildly decent improvement, but I wouldn't call it great. If you bereave the almost non-existent and poorly executed main plot, the season is still entirely enjoyable, topped off with Bruce action scenes, funny jokes, and entertaining characters. Okay, let's take a break for a minute and talk about what I like to call Four Theory. So if you've paid attention to the show like I have, you might know that for some reason the show really likes the number four. It's like how Jin likes the number four in League of Legends. I mean, think about it. Every four years a new ninja is chosen, there's four grades in high school and four years in high school, Four years the show supposedly spent in development, the show spent almost four years on the air, freaking four words in the title if you dismiss the nine, four letters in the word mask, four ninjas shown on screen, Randy, Howard, Ninja Prime, and Ninja Kronk, unless you count Mac Anthony, of which that makes five, four main villains in McFist, Viceroy, the Sorcerer, and later Evil Julian, four Sorcerer Balls scattered, four limbs, four wheels in some of its car, four members in McFist's family, himself, his wife, his stepson, and his brother, and if you count his deceased father, then that makes five. I mean, for God's sake, the show first aired on a juicing leap year. A LEAP YEAR! Okay, I might be going too far with this, but if my theory is correct, then that is some insane dedication right there. But why? 
why is the show so subtly obsessed with the number four? And the number obsession is really ironic too because in Japan, the ninja's home country, the number four is oft seen as an omen, the number of death, and so it's highly avoided in Japanese society and other parts of Asia. So Why the Juice is a show about a kid turning into a Japanese super warrior obsessed with a supposedly cursed number in the ninja's native country? Well, I might have a theory for this. In numerology, the number four has various meanings other than death, such as loyalty, responsibility, and conscientiousness, which is another word for honorable, but it also represents stubbornness, rigidness, and people born with this number tend to be a know-it-all, which I think greatly describes Randy's personality in the show. He's lazy, brash, and tends to be a smart aleck, yet he has some sort of heart of gold and carries the weight of responsibility with him being the ninja. A person born with this number can be hard pushing towards their goal, but also pushing back, pushing traditional activities and interests over work and often not listening. Which I think is a perfect description of Randy's character arc. I believe this number is used to represent Randy climbing his way to become the best ninja there ever was, and also genuinely a better person. That might be why there's four main villains in McFist, Viceroy the Sorcerer, and later Evil Julian, with old EJ possibly fitting as this sort of final challenge given how he's shown as an evil stronger than the sorcerer. Well, that's just my best theory for now. And now, back to the show. Now back to the show. Randy Cunningham, Ninth Grade Ninja, continues on Disney XD. Alright, so one day, during a field trip to Little Norrisville, Howard gets one of those Japanese cat statue thingies that, according to Salesman Pink from Kung Fu Panda over here, is said to grant wishes to whoever holds it which is thanks to the Sorcerer Ball inside of it, of which Howard puts into good use throughout the day, but Randy thinks it's all just coincidences, because you know, of course he doesn't believe in magic. But then, a hooded person comes to the gift shop to find one of the Sorcerer Balls. Spoilers, it's evil Julian in disguise. Just before the students leave, the stranger attacks and draws out the ninja, and thanks in no small part to the statue, Howard is able to keep the stranger out of reach and save Randy. How lucky! As the two argue about getting rid of the statue, they find the third sorcerer ball inside the statue, explaining its paranormal properties. Randy goes out to confront the stranger and turns out it's good old EJ in disguise. Who would have thunk? And they duke it out. As Howard watches, he accidentally makes a wish, which shows that the ball's power juice is draining due to the abuse of wishes. And so he puts his abuse to good use in the fight, wishing for souvenirs and a neon sign that says how Brucey is on it. But then Julian escapes and Randy throws away the ball on the bus, causing it to break and for the very last drop of power to drop into the city's water supply, infecting the citizens and turning them into digging slaves. Which Howard is completely oblivious to and think they're digging for a contest. So Randy takes a peek into the Namacon and meets up with Ninja Prime, who tells him that unless Randy can get the Sorcerer Balls, an evil more powerful than the Sorcerer will be unleashed upon the world. So he heads back home to get his one ball and sees Howard on the other side. Howard's found another one as well, and then Randy's stopped by Teresa. Give me the ball. It makes good work of her. So he heads back to the park to find Howard until they're found by Evil Julian, who commands his army to take the ball from Howard. Thankfully, using his own ball, Randy turns them away, and they duke it out. Randy uses the ball's power in this fight, and doing such makes him succumb to the dark pleasure, even almost killing EJ in the process. But then he sees Howard injured and lets go of not his one ball, but Howard's as well. Howard, with some dust in his throat, decides to drink some water, only to get infected, oh, man. forcing Randy to decide either to save Howard or stop EJ from using his balls. Of course, Randy chose the first option, lets EJ become more powerful than he ever was, and then he escapes. With the sky blackening with a sickly green tinge upon him, Randy, and I guess the audience's final lesson, is now at hand. Hey, Randy. Oh, Teresa, hey, you're my groom girl. Never been. <laughs> Smooth cutting him. Smooth. Okay, this is gonna be a big one, so bear with me here. On this day of reckoning, Randy's parents are moving? Wait, really? You're moving at a time like this? Well, given the circumstances at least, that makes total sense, so I'd say it's fine. Anyway, Randy's parents are moving, and with his newly found threat, Randy has about 24 hours to get rid of EJ and save the world. So he heads to EJ's location, good old Mount Chuck, where he's opening a portal to summon his demon army, and so Randy sloops into the Namacon one last time, which shows all the events that led up to this moment, and Randy's final, ultimate lesson for the series is, when facing an unbeatable enemy, seek an unlikely ally. 
a very vague lesson that has him interpreting Howard as his unlikely ally, and so he gives him a call to meet him at Mount Chuck. Is this the crosstown? Oh, the 23 goes crosstown. 15 minutes? Yeah, I can wait 15 minutes, I'm in no rush. Randy heads inside to fight EJ, and they do get out, again. As this fight lingers, EJ summons one of his demons, a hand monster thingy that he rides around like a motorcycle. Then Howard arrives, and after a bit of fighting and chattering, EJ sends our heroes to the Shadow Realm and begins his assault on Earth, terrifying the students and absorbing the sorcerer's stank, which has also caught the attention of McFist. How convenient. Greetings, former classmates! <laughs> this is the part where you scream. Back in the Shadow Realm, Randy and Howard find Julian. Remember when I said he would play a significant role? Well, this is one of them. Apparently, Julian's been in the Shadow Realm for some time, and his skull friend Tyler knows of a way out. Through a valley of pig asses and ancient stone ruins of a long-gone civilization. Back on Earth, the sorcerer has been milked dry of his power, and Julian has become unassailable. But then McFist barges in and has a little chat with old EJ, which goes exactly like how you think it would. Anyway, back to Randy and Howard, they find the sorcerer's old self? Wait, pre-sorcerer, how have you been alive here for so long? I can understand Julian being alive for at least a few months, but you've been down here for almost millennia. You should be in that pile of bones right next to you by now. Oh well, he tells Randy that the only way out is through the giant pile of bones, through the jaws of an evil beast that kind of looks like an evil mix of Heatran and Terrakian from Pokemon. So Randy fells the beast with a ring that also frees pre-sorcerer and they escape back to Earth just in time to stop EJ, and just as Randy's in the grasp of the evil sorcerer Julian, the lesson comes back to tell him that his unlikely ally is the sorcerer. Despite Randy's reluctance, he frees the sorcerer so that the real battle can begin, and the sorcerer easily regains his power and they duke it out. Randy gives EJ's minion a trim and finishes it off with a fireball, while the sorcerer regains more of his power, giving Randy the chance to break EJ's ball and his mechanical shell. But wait, it's not over yet, as the sorcerer turns on the ninja to do what he should have done 800 years ago. He draws out his own blade and even breaks the ninja's own sword, and just as he's gonna finish the job, Howard and Julian return. Oh yeah, and uh, Julian reunites with his evil self and becomes whole again. Woohoo. And to finish this whole ordeal, Randy snatches the sorcerer's balls and Howard's shoe, throws them into the sorcerer's prison hole, and seals it up for good, putting an end to 800 years of total war. Oh yeah, and uh, here's another montage. As the sorcerer laments his loss, pre-sorcerer comes in, telling his old friend that it's all over, and they reunite as one, ascending to heaven. Which, can I talk about this for a second? How can the sorcerer and pre-sorcerer Thanos off into heaven but not Julian after reuniting with his evil self? Do you have to be in the Shadow Realm for an insane amount of time before you die? Does this happen when you're past your death date? Why does Julian get to live but not the sorcerer? Who can or can't die? I just don't know. And neither does the show, apparently. Anyway, this pretty much means that he did it. Randy won. He defeated the sorcerer, or I guess the sorcerer defeated himself, and McFist is free from his terrible bargain. But all that hard work can't stop Randy from moving away from his friend, and they bid their farewell. <laughs> just kidding. Turns out that Randy was just moving to the house next door and not so very far away. I mean, don't you like it when nothing matters? But yeah, it was all just a complete misunderstanding, and so everyone, everywhere, lives happily ever after. The end. You enjoy those snacks, Ninja. Your greatest battle is just around the bend. Heh. <laughs> Okay, what the honkin' juice was that? Of all the things you can do to end Randy Cunningham, you had to do it on a cliffhanger. And what's interesting about this is that it ends on this mustache man, who is perhaps the most elusive figure in the show, and the character I saved the best for last. 
Again, again, again. The fact that this guy has showed up in every episode in the background and dates even further in the lore is insane. That is honestly some hard dedication for a Disney show. He's officially referred to as the Creep, but who is he exactly? Is he an Oni? Is he a Yokai? A time traveler? Or is he from the Shadow Realm, like EJ and the Sorcerer? Well, I just, I just don't know, because the show never tells us, and I guess we'll never know now that the show's been over for seven years. I'm sure he's supposed to be the antagonist of a third season or possibly an ally, but like I said, we might just never know. And if you don't know whether or not your show will continue after season two, don't end it on a cliffhanger. Oh my god, this is like my baby series of vampire all over again. Well, according to the show's wiki, he's actually a messenger of the Namicon, and he is immortal. But even then, his reasons for association with the ninja Namicon are never brought up in the show. Anyway, about the episode, this might be a controversial take, but I kinda didn't like the series finale for the show. In fact, I might even go as far as to say it's the worst episode of Randy Cunningham history. The show may have had some weird and almost bad episodes, but this one is my least favorite because it showcases the lowest in Randy Cunningham's writing. Which really sucks because the show has genuinely tried at good storytelling, and then this one just wonks it all up. Things just happen in the story with little to zero elaboration, the inconsistent tone makes it hard to take the story seriously, like even in the end the students don't just thank Randy for saving the universe, they just walk off like it's a regular day at Norrisville. The stakes didn't matter all because of a simple misunderstanding, Evil Julian was really annoying, and it ended the series in a way that honestly felt disappointing and haphazard. I guess going full Metal Gear Rising for the climax and killing the sorcerer was just too expensive or a complete no-go from Disney. And something like the sorcerer getting redeemed or whatever the hell happened could have honestly worked if he had like a character arc, but he didn't, and so now this part just comes off as forced. TLDR, this episode wasn't great, nor was it a good send-off to the series. At least to me anyway. Oh yeah, there's also bloopers after the credits like in Toy Story 2 or Monsters Inc. And I honestly think that's pretty Bruce and my personal highlight of the finale. I kinda wish other modern cartoons did this. Whoopi, do you wanna lick Howard's face? Well yeah! <laughs> he wants to lick my- mm. It wasn't me, it was Whoopi! Right Whoopi? Well, no. Oh, come on! It also shines a little light on the creep. So much for that character, I guess. Randy Cunningham Season 2 has plenty of noticeable issues. The inconsistent story and the poor development of the story are more noticeable here than the first, and while it didn't end the series spectacularly, I still believe that this is a fun season. The fight scenes are better and more action-y, the characters are still endearing and funny, the episodes are a lot more creative, and overall I'd gladly say it's better than the first, but by only a small margin. I can't call it great, but I still do enjoy this one overall. This season is the Galaxy 2 of Randy Cunningham, and I am happy to rate this one a 7.5 out of 10. Pretty honkin' Bruce, if you ask me. So here we are now. Seven years later. So what happened? Why was the show cancelled? Why did it end on a cliffhanger? What happened to the crew? Well, as far as I know, the official reason for the series cancellation is unknown. I even messaged the leads on Instagram and Twitter for an answer, but so far they never responded. Some suggest that it wasn't raking enough profit for Disney, or Disney wasn't willing to give them another chance. The latter I think sounds logical given Disney's general incompetence and their treatment of the Owl House. But to put on my tinfoil hat, my personal theory for this is because of the fact the show is airing on Disney XD, a smaller network to Disney channel, and how despite having a decent audience, it got little to no promotion outside of its own network, and thus was unable to catch on like Gravity Falls and Phineas and Ferb, which were seemingly Disney's biggest TV priorities at the time. The fact that it was even airing at the same time as Gravity Falls is also kind of a red flag, especially when you compare them in ratings. That's a really bad sign. Regardless of whether it was because of Disney's incompetence, the show was cancelled after two seasons. The creators Jed Elinoff and Scott Thomas have since stuck to live-action shows, most recently producing the sci-fi horror show Day of the Dead, and are currently working on Raven's Home. And the crew, I can only assume, have moved on to greener pastures, mostly live-action according to IMDb. And as the 2010s rolled around with cartoon after cartoon, Randy Cunningham has faded into the shadow of obscurity. Along with other Disney XD shows such as Kick Wachowski, 7D, Motor City, Tron Uprising, and Kid vs. Cat. 
and since then, there have been no updates regarding the show, other than the series coming to Disney Plus in 2020. As of the writing of the script, there are no plans to revive Randy Cunningham at all. But there is a small glimmer of hope. Though the show is long cancelled, it's recently gained a small cult resurgence thanks to sites like YouTube and Twitter, and the fandom is still active, albeit in seldom numbers. There's even a petition on Change.org to get the show a third season, which Scott Thomas has actually acknowledged. While I highly doubt it'll ever come to be, given Disney's interest in episodic shows recently, it is a Bruce cause. But what if we were in an alternate reality? What if I was in charge of Disney and had an ounce of care for the series? But for me, the best course of action for this series would be a semi-sequel slash reboot on Disney Plus in the same vein as Loud Family Louder and Prouder. If Randy Cunningham 9th Grade Ninja does get a reboot, here's how I would reboot it. Number 1. Make it a little more serialized. Not every cartoon needs to be a serious show with an overarching narrative and deep lore. Yes, that is true. Not every show needs to be the next Gravity Falls or Owl House or Steven Universe, but adding a little bit of serialization could work for a premise like Randy Cunningham. Make it a little reminiscent of, say, Spectacular Spider-Man. In fact, Randy Cunningham is just a Spider-Man knockoff, so why not dive into the tropes that come with Spider-Man type characters? This would allow the show to really dive more into the whole great power, great responsibility shtick, while still maintaining the show's goofy, kick-ass tone, and letting a serious moment be serious for once. You know, dive into Randy's own decision-making and his own psyche, struggling between his normal and everyday life in Norrisville, his romance, and his duty that was forced unto him by the Nomicon, and also portray him as not being so perfect with the whole ninja thing, actually learning moves and using them instead of just magically gifted since the first episode. And as he learns from the Nomicon and the school itself, he becomes not only a better ninja, but also genuinely a better person. He matures while still maintaining that wise-cracking attitude, like Spider-Man. Oh yeah, and hopefully make it a little less juvenile, that way it can appeal to everyone else. Number 2. Keep the art style. Honan Vasquez's art style for the show is a Bruce fit, and it makes the show stick out more from a sea of visual schlock. And if I were to reboot the show, I would get him onto the animation team to at least modernize it. Kind of like how he did with Invader Zim Enter the Forpus, keeping that edgy look to it while still adjusting it for a more modern audience. Number 3. Make Teresa a part of the story. The Randy X Teresa ship in the show is mainly used as a will they won't they type joke. I'm pretty sure it was meant to be dived into into season 3, but you might as well dive into it early. I would make it function like Peter Parker x Mary Jane, with a twist. With Randy trying to keep things together between his romance and his duty as the ninja, but then, when she finds out or something, he has to potentially break up with her to keep up with the Nomicon, and also to keep her safe. This would play off that liar revealed trope in kids movies and build on that fallout. Randy would feel heartbroken and Teresa would potentially take down a more villainous path, turning into the sorcerer's puppet and becoming a Red Hood type character. An evil ninja with a bow stick or Kratos style chainsicles and an oni mask and doing the sorcerer's bidding, eventually redeeming herself in the end. Or she takes a peek into the Nomicon, somehow, and through some random bullshit takes on her own ninja alter ego, becoming a sort of black cat like character. The Catwoman to Randy's Batman, if you catch my metaphor. Look, I don't know how to weave it in organically, okay? Just make her evil and give her a cool weapon and a cool ninja outfit. Got it? Good. Number 4. Give the Sorcerer a Motivation I'll be real here, the Sorcerer is not a really well fleshed out villain. I'm fine. I'm happy with how he is in the show because he's got a Bruce personality and cause like, come on, it's Tim Friggin' Curry. But he doesn't really have a clear goal that sets him as a villain, other than to simply cause chaos for the fun of it. Well, here's the origin I would give him. I would have it be that the sorcerer was a lowly farmer, just like in the show, until his wife fell ill with a disease. He would pray to the gods for a cure, and none of them would listen, except for the evil ones who tell him that in order to save his wife, he would have to satiate them by causing chaos, and then they can help him save his wife. So he strikes a deal, which twists him into the tall, evil broccoli man we all know and love. And so he ran amok in Edo Norrisville until he was imprisoned by the ninja. Since then, he has been at war with the ninja from within his bars, and when he escapes one day and finds out his wife has been dead for a long while, he gets really upset and vows one day to kill the ninja himself. Personally. That's the motive I would give to the sorcerer. It would paint him as a tragic, sympathetic type villain like Mr. Freeze, a naive guy who did evil sh** out of the cause he thinks would save his loved one, only for it to devolve into a revenge arc. That, I think, would be pretty Bruce. Number 5. 
Let a serious moment be serious. I know the show is trying to be a comedy, but the tone really gets in the way at points and it undermines the seriousness of certain scenes. I mean, come on. When's a moment of character development ever hurt anybody? Okay, fine, but only because of bad writing. Let the show try to tell the story it wants to tell without a shitty joke getting in the way. Or hell, try to integrate in some sort of organic fashion, if you know what I'm saying. Number 6. I have nothing to add, I just wanted to do that. And number 7, end the show on a positive note. If you don't know whether your show will end after two seasons, then don't end it on a wonkin cliffhanger. End the show on a note that could not only be a positive one, but also open it up for more interpretive ways if the story were to continue. This could go either four ways. A. Randy and Teresa finally get together. B. Time skip where Randy graduates and moves on to college, passing the Namacon to the next ninth grader. C. Randy establishes a ninja clan within the school grounds, teaching moves and forming a Power Ranger style team up with his friends. Or D. I, I don't know, I just put D in for good measure. Or heck, you could just start over in the same vein as Legend of Korra in the same universe with a new character to inherit the Namicon and fight new baddies, such as the Creep or the Sorcerer's Rat, or even a grown-up Bash Johnson inheriting McFist Industries. Somehow, who I'd imagine would be like a cross between Harry Osborn and Senator Armstrong from MGR, and slap a mustache on him. Have all the old characters grown up and appear as cameos and carry the spirit of the show in a fashion that feels fresh to new fans, yet familiar to old ones. That is how I would reboot Randy Cunningham. Also, I would totally be down for a console video game. Imagine Metal Gear Rising for kids where you go around Norrisville fighting robots and monsters while rules of nature blast in the background. And you traverse Norrisville by swinging your scarf around, throwing smoke bombs at the end of each level, among other Bruce sh It would be El Bru f Cheesemo. But hey, that's just wishful thinking. Anyway, to bring this video to a close, that's Randy Cunningham, 9th Grade Ninja. If you want to watch this show, you can always catch all two seasons on Disney+. And to give it an overall score, I would give it a 7 out of 10. This was overall a really fun show to revisit, but is it great? No. But it definitely was Honkin' Bruce. I'm B Meister Reviews, and if there's somehow hope for the future, well here's a special thanks from me to you. SMOKE BOMB!